Hey pals, this week's movie and our choice of jokes for this movie are a little not safe for work. There was a moment that we caught on to near the end of the movie that runs throughout this episode of the podcast has to do with um, <clears throat> certain male anatomy. So it runs through the whole episode of this podcast. We just want to warn you ahead of time, this is a not safe for work and not safe around kids episode. So um, this is just one to enjoy yourself. It's a hilarious, one of our funniest episodes of the podcast. So we definitely want you to check it out. Just, you know, Keep in mind what company you have around you. Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to the thing I did not work on. I did not work on a better way to say this. Let's see. Let's workshop it right now. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon of the action movies of the two greatest decades, 1975 to 1990. How's that? Eh. <laughs> This week, we're talking about Showdown in Little Tokyo, which originally premiered on August 23rd, 1991. This movie is The Sleeper, and this is one that's deep in the catalog of action movies that people often forget about, and with good reason, they forget about this movie. However, we will mm -hmm. learn about the guest stars later in this movie. It deserves a rewatch when you have the opportunity because of the people who are in this movie and based on where their careers went afterwards. Still not saying it's a good movie. But it is worth a rewatch <laughs> or a watch if you haven't seen it. Mm -hmm. It is directed by Mark L. Lester. Now, Mark, Mr. Lester, he's directed some great stuff, actually. Commando, Class of 1984, Armed and Dangerous, starring John Candy, which came out in 1986, and Eugene Levy. Like, that's actually a really funny movie. But more importantly, he's also directed some other movies that are right in our wheelhouse. Things held like Truck Stop Women, Gold of the Amazon Women, Roller Boogie. And Poseidon Rex. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but I want to know what Roller Boogie is. <laughs> yeah, that's the one I want to see. Excuse me while I look this up really fast, but as far as I remember, Roller Boogie stars Linda Blair. And it is, in fact, what you think it is, which is breaking, but on roller skates. Well, then why didn't we watch that? <laughs> I didn't know Roller Boogie was an option. <laughs> <laughs> He's also directed a fair number of movies that are like straight to sci-fi movies, like Poseidon Rex, well, yeah, which is... I mean. <laughs> what it sounds like a gigantic t-rex in the ocean it is written by stephen glantz and calliope brattle street that's a great name calliope yeah that is calliope brattle street that's a great name they didn't write anything else fuck knows what they all say <laughs> did but that's she's got a great name <laughs> <laughs> before we get started to check in see what's going on in each other's lives and pals it was just halloween so we're recording this on november 3rd so that means halloween had just passed you're not going to hear this for another week so halloween's really far away now. halloween's really far away by the time you actually hear this and what's been growing in our household is our son our 13 year old son he is like i want to watch real horror movies yeah he's also like a 13 year almost 13 years old tomorrow <laughs> <laughs> and he's very much like i'm a big strong yeah, guy he's like, at the i'm not age scared of where, yeah he's at the age of where he's gonna find all the gore and guts of like chainsaw massacre cool what well, he says it's cool and he says he's a tough guy but upon watching Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Halloween and Pet Cemetery, evidence is suggesting otherwise. He is, in <laughs> fact, scared. <laughs> Especially during <laughs> Halloween when there was, you know, Halloween's got lots of jump scares and he was jumping out of his skin and, and all of them, <laughs> like jumping out of the chair. <laughs> At one point, the computer made a noise and he thought it was in the movie and he like almost jumped out the window. <laughs> I'd love to hear from you Ugh. and everyone out there. And what's that first movie you watched as a kid that really scared you? And not like I was four and I watched named an 80s Disney movie that really scared me. No, like, like an horror actual movie, horror movie and it scared you. Mine what's was your first? Texas Chainsaw Massacre scared the crap out of me. <laughs> uh, Pet Cemetery. I think was the first one that really got me. It just so, creeped me out so bad. Mine is a weird one because I had a friend when I was in elementary school who loved horror movies. We were like eight, right? And he loved to watch horror movies. And one time he made me watch Salem's Lot, the original Salem's Lot. And I cannot, even to this day, get that picture out of my head of that kid floating in front of the window, like tapping on the glass. I've never seen that movie, so then now I'm like uh, intrigued. <laughs> yeah. It is an old one, and it scares me. And you me never as... will. <laughs> <laughs> hey, secret. You know what else scared the crap out of him? The Conjuring. Yeah. Conjuring is scary. <laughs> it scared the crap out of me, too. I'm not saying that. 
I was trying to decide because I know Pet Cemetery uh, got me, and so did Amityville Horror. And I watched them. I think it, at like the same t- the same year. Amityville Horror just the just the look of the house was just creepy. <laughs> let alone the the guy with the axe. Just for the record, the scariest movie that's ever been made is Jesus Camp. Don't at me. <laughs> <laughs> True words were never spoken. <laughs> Close off all the loose ends. Roller Boogie is the 1979 American romantic musical drama starring Linda Blair and introduces Jim Bray, a former competitive artistic skater. The film is set in Venice hmm. uh, to heighten the horse skating fad in the 70s. Two characters, Bray and Blair, fall in love while boogie skating to disco music. Along the way, they must thwart a powerful mobster who wants to oh. land their favorite roller rink, sits on, oh on and compete. In the boogie contest. So it's just electric boogaloo. <laughs> just break into electric boogaloo, okay? Without the break in. So, no, I don't want to watch it. <laughs> well, speaking of mobsters, this movie Seems is full of them. <laughs> <laughs> we got lots of great mobsters in this movie and some so so karate. So, let's Not go so break great. this one down. <laughs> All right, so this movie opens with the music and the opening credits so we don't have a a a true opening of action however this movie is action packed so let's get to the guest stars now yeah that's a good idea let's talk (laughs) about the man the myth the man with the giant dong Dolph Lundgren (laughs) that'll come up again later (laughs) that's gonna come up a lot in this movie as we discuss it because he is a legend according to Brandon Lee (laughs) Let's talk about them and then get on to the movie. John, what do you got for us this week? Why don't we just lead off with Dolph Lundgren, who plays Sergeant Chris Kenner. Dolph Lundgren, he was born in Stockholm, Sweden. He actually first got into martial arts while he was serving uh, in the Swedish military. And then when he got out, he wanted to study engineering. He went to the Royal Institute of Tech. While he was studying, he became a world-class competitor in Japanese karate. He's actually a third on our third degree black belt in uh kayakushin karate guys there's so much that i'm gonna butcher name wise by the way <laughs> if i mispronounce something it's it's not on purpose i'm sounding it out i'm doing my best hey, hey uh, that's hooked all on you can phonics do. didn't work for me <laughs> that's all you can do for people who if you've never heard someone say it that's not that's all you can do so we're taking it and dude Dolph Lundgren is like a genius so like he's he Graduates from the Royal Institute of Tech. He attended Washington State University, Clemson, University of South Car- Carolina. Uh, he got a master's, his master's degree in chemical engineering from the University of Sydney. And then while in Sydney, he became a bodyguard for Jamaican singer Grace Jones. Grace Jones, a huge singer. They actually started a relationship. And while he was on scholarship at MIT, of all freaking places, she talked him into moving to New York with her, where he would decide to pursue acting. I mean, let's just, a master's in chemical engineering, third degree black belt, dating a pop star. Who is this guy? <laughs> a man with a oh. huge penis, remember? <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> so, and like most men with huge penises, he had a short stint as a model and a bouncer. <laughs> Tell me I'm wrong. <laughs> Just say, no, I'm kidding. So he would get his first role. He had he would have a small role in James Bond flick called A View to Kill in 1985. And that role would help land him an audition that would eventually become the role of Ivan Drago in Rocky IV. If he dies, he dies. <laughs> seriously, seriously, one of the greatest roles in not just in all the Rocky movies, but just in action movies and like or in sports movies. He's like, the greatest villain. Think about it. what other villains are there that are better yeah. than him. And he ha- doesn't—he doesn't even hardly talk in yeah, the especially, <laughs> especially for like bad guy sports uh, villains, because like you, you've all seen that sports movie, and they're supposed to be like the opposing player or something that like you're supposed to dislike. Like Jar- Ivan Jargo was perfect at that point. He would move to L.A. and. Dude, right out the gate, he was set on a path to become the next Arnold Schwarzenegger somewhat. Jumps out, he goes, he man, he plays He-Man in Masters of the Universe in 87. Lieutenant Radneko in Red Scorpion in 1988, which is a 
good action movie and we might actually do later later oh, on yeah. let's do that one um, <laughs> but he also in 1989 played the role as frank castle in the movie the punisher which at the time comic book movies weren't very big and so it kind of flew under the radar right now in the age of comic book movies that's pretty huge. And the fact that I'm a big comic book fan and I didn't know that that movie existed, I am definitely going to go back and rewatch it, whether or not we do a podcast on that. Next, you're going to tell me uh, Ben Affleck so, plays a blind superhero in a movie. <laughs> no, nah, don't be ridiculous. Ben Affleck as <laughs> a superhero. This point, this movie, you had to think. Dolph Lundgren, the man that played He-Man, the man that played Ivan Drago, like he was going to be a huge star. So this movie showdown in little tokyo they got a brandon lee who they who studios at the time also thought was going to be a huge star like his dad they paired them together and it just didn't kind of work out which we'll talk about as we get into the movie but this is kind of what leads to a series of direct to video movies so from like 95 to the 2000s it was just like direct-to-video stuff with Dolph until eventually The Expendables kind of broke him back into doing some mainstream movies. There was a good time there that it that he just wasn't having a ton of success. That's not saying that he hasn't been in other great movies. He was in the Universal Soldier franchise, which is fantastic. Uh, I loved him in Johnny Mnemonic. Uh, he was in... And I'm just going to throw this out there. He was in a very bad movie called The Peacekeeper, but it had Montel Williams in it. And yes, <laughs> it is that Montel Williams. Nice. <laughs> well, so, where's my phone? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Where did it go? <laughs> really, he had gotten into just doing those. Uh, in fact, you made the joke about those sci-fi channel movies. Like, he has done a bunch of those as well. But The Expendables really kind of broke him out of that. And so he's got some pretty cool stuff coming out, coming up soon, including some guest spots and some TV stuff. But let's move on to Brandon Lee. Brandon Lee plays Johnny Murata. Brandon Lee was born in 1965 to Bruce Lee and Linda Lee Caldwell. Bruce Lee is... Bruce Lee, epic kung fu artist, made all those kung fu movies, Enter the Dragon. His mom, Linda Lee Caldwell, uh, I believe she was a teacher. So, and he actually, he grew up in Hong Kong as a child. He became fluent in Cantonese while they lived there, while his dad was recording mm. a bunch of movies in Hong Kong at the time. And like I alluded to when I was talking about Dolph, studios really thought he was going to be massively successful like his dad. He broke into acting with his debut being opposite of David. David Carradine in the Kung Fu the movie TV oh, movie. Really? And uh, they starred him in a spinoff of Kung Fu called Kung Fu the Next Generation. Originally, like his date break in the acting, they were trying to break him into take over David Carradine on Kung Fu, basically. Wow. Uh, it just didn't work out. He would go from there and to jump into doing Kung Fu movies like his dad. He would do Rapid Fire in 92, Legacy of Rage in 86, which would be his immediately after to the kung fu movie he would actually turn down the role of his dad in dragon the bruce lee story probably kind of felt like he didn't want to play his dad didn't want to follow him you know yeah he didn't uh, want pe so, he didn't unfortunately, want people to think of him as just like he's just in his dad's legacy he'd be setting his own legacy instead of just always like telling his dad's story he made a couple more movies but the big one was the crow the crow was supposed to be his breakout role and it's actually cult favorite movies it has a cult following of people who just love the crow but during the filming he actually died in a freak accident on set so i guess what happened was they decided to use a gun in the scene that they hadn't originally they weren't originally going to use a gun for. And for some reason, they didn't get consent from the weapons coordinator because he had been sent home early, I guess. Weird. So then the gun they used, a bullet had been lodged in the barrel. And so when they loaded it with a blank, the blank basically fired the lodged bullet out or something. And it got him in the uh -oh. spine. All in all, wow. it was a freak accident. He would pass away after five hours of surgery trying to save him. The actor, Michael Massey, who shot him, he was screwed up, man. He said, like, he's still messed up about it. He's still yeah. in an interview, like, I can't, I can't go back and watch that movie. And at the time, 
Brandon Lee was actually set to marry a woman named Mary Elise Hutton. So he was like just getting ready to like really start his life. Tragedy that that because that was probably going to be his big break. Yeah, it was going to be the turning point. Everything. Get married, being in a big movie, finally moving out from under his dad's shadow. Mm -hmm. So that brings us to Kari Hiroyuki Tagawa. Actually, I think I did pretty good with that one. Yeah, that sounds pretty good. Probably better than the first time you said his uh, name on Vice. <laughs> he plays Vanekai Yoshida. His first big break was in Bernardo Bertolucci's The Last Emperor in 1987. Mm. He was an army brat. His dad was army. His mom was an actress from Tokyo. Guys, he has pretty much, if you watch the cop show in the late 80s, early 90s, he played the Asian bad guy. <laughs> like that's 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 pretty much like like serious and he actually popped up in a bunch of michael mann stuff he was uh two different characters in two different episodes of vice which isn't surprising uh he was in an episode of moonlighting he was in the la takedown movie and just a ton of other cop shows outside of the michael mann stuff outside of that he was in 30 episodes of the The Man in the High Castle, which I believe is an Amazon show. Yes. And he was in five episodes of the new Lost in Space, which is a Netflix show. So still staying busy. Interesting that he's in that um, Man in the High Castle because the premise of that is if the Allies lost World War II and then the world was split in half mm -hmm. between Germany and, and Japan. Those two countries agree to just split everything mm. in half. Ah. So, and also, See, that sounds pretty interesting. I might have to start watching. That. Yeah, it's, it's a, a great book, right? It's, yeah. yeah, it's based on a great book too by Philip mm. K. Dick. I'll always remember Tagawa in that great scene in Vice where it's pouring rain and Dad and Tagawa have to samurai sword fight out there. Then they just leave all the bodies. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. So awesome. Outside of his TV career, he's actually had a pretty accomplished movie career. He's played some pretty pretty uh, well-known characters in movies. He played Shang Tsung in Mortal Kombat 1995. And based on my age, that was in my childhood. So that's how I'll always remember him uh, as <laughs> Shang Tsung. You know, in that one scene where he's got that look, where he's pointing at Raiden. Uh -huh. With the bad CGI um, in the yeah. background. <laughs> but he also played... Yes. Yeah. Finish him. Uh, uh, sorry. <laughs> but he also played Kroll... In Planet of the Apes in 2001, that was the... Mm. Um, uh, the, the Tim Burton one. The 2001... Hell, the Marky Mark one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's directed by Tim Burton. The Mark Wahlberg one. I didn't oh, know that okay. was Tim Burton. Yeah. Huh. He also played Quang in License to Kill in 89, which is another Bond flick, which is actually the Bond flick after the uh, one that Dolph was in. He played El Japo in American Me in 92 with dad from vice but he's also done a bunch of voice work for like video games and animated movies a ton of moral combat and tekken stuff overwatch dragons he was the narrator if you play overwatch oh wow <laughs> currently he is the he is developing a new form of martial arts that he calls chun shin in his free time while he coaches martial arts to the <laughs> actor portraying shang shung in the moral combat live tour Whatever that is, keep your eye out for the Mortal Kombat Live Tour coming to a fairgrounds near you. <laughs> All right, guys. Our last guest star is Tia Carrera. And that might sound familiar because she was also in our first podcast episode in Hartley Davidson and the Marble Man. Yeah, she's back. <laughs> We're just going to tie um, everything back to that movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, never mind. Not Vice yes. anymore. It's the Marlboro yes. Man. <laughs> As I talked about back then, her first big break was on General Hospital. She's a uh, Hawaiian. She's actually quite accomplished as a Hawaiian uh, musician. Um making Hawaiian, Hawaiian music, actually won several Grammys that way. See, she's been on some reality shows, uh, Dancing with the Stars, the fifth season of The Apprentice. One of her first, or, like, the most original thing she ever did was she was eliminated in the first round as a singer on in her on an 85 episode of Star Search. Her longest-running TV show was The Relic Hunter on Fox from 99 to 02. Also played Cassandra in Wayne's World and Wayne's World 2. So as the credits roll, just to make sure we go back to that, there's lots of flexing. You can see a man's chest very, very up close. 
including his belt line, which is pulled really low and this razor burn in this northern crotch area. So that made me really uncomfortable. That kind of set the tone for the rest of the movie. <laughs> <laughs> like, seriously, it's like he's been thinking about that ever since. Like, I can't get over that guy's like razor burn. Like, why didn't you do something about that? Why were you shaved right there? <laughs> So we start off and we're in an MMA fight, bare knuckle, very classic Kumite style fight that's happening in little Tokyo in Los Angeles. And of mm-hmm. course, Dolph, he's young and hip. He's up with his leather jacket up on the roof about to break this whole thing down by himself as a one man wrecking crew. And at first I thought he was just tagging in. Like I thought this was <laughs> like, like, a, uh, like I thought like big John Stubb is going to come running out and, and jump in the ring too. <laughs> He just jumps down from the roof into the middle of the ring and says, you're under arrest. And Tanaka laughs at him, tells his fighters to get him. He starts taking care of business, does the old punch kick, you know, the way you punch forward, but kick backwards. Pow. You know, he does that. He's also like seven feet tall, so he's able to like <laughs> very kick much- people in the back of the yes. building and then at the front door. Like very much a giant. <laughs> he looks like he's a giant compared to everybody. Oh, yeah. And that's very movie. noticeable through the, yeah. <laughs> Throughout the whole movie, he is just... Like five feet taller than everyone. <laughs> Especially during some of the fight scenes, it's like he has to be crouching down because it's like they're not that, they look like they're pretty close in size. So he's got to be like on his knees or something. Yeah. <laughs> At the same time, so, a competing gang, what, Yashida's gang, are coming into the club as well. Yeah, what bad luck. Like, not only are they getting busted, but they're being robbed at the same time. <laughs> Crap luck. <laughs> <laughs> Dolph tries to stop them, has to go out into the street, and then he does his best Kobe Ryan impression, try, jumping over a car as it tries to run him over. But this is way more impressive because he does it Not in cowboy boots and a car. leather jacket. <laughs> and it's a, it's a karate jump. It's like a karate kick <laughs> jump over the car. <laughs> Not a regular jump. John wants to make sure that I put it there. <laughs> You mentioned it too when we were watching. He didn't just do like a jump, did like a flying kick yeah. over it as yeah. it, as they he drove to them. He jumped, but no. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's got to earn him some more points. It was a useful jump. Like had someone <laughs> stood up in the car, he would have kicked them. <laughs> so, but obviously, obviously jumping over cars, that'll make you hungry, you, you know. So we follow this up with noodles. Dolph having sushi for breakfast. <laughs> this movie steps on the gas pedal and never lets off there's never a point in this movie where like things should just chill for a little bit every scene including the sex scene <laughs> oh no he's pretty chill <laughs> we'll get i don't there. think he's alive <laughs> we'll i think he's sleepy <laughs> The same gang comes into this restaurant. No one has changed their clothes. They just stayed up all night. Everyone just stayed up all night. Yeah. And now they want protection money out of the restaurant owner. Dolph comes over and says, or sorry, Kenner. I'll stop calling him Dolph. I'll stop calling him his character name. Kenner comes over and says he's not happy with that. It's breakfast. Shootout fight happens. And that's when Brandon Lee comes in and he thinks that he needs to stop the fight altogether. He thinks Dolph was a bad guy. Sorry, Kenner is a bad guy. <laughs> mm-hmm. They fight, but then the gang starts shooting at them in the restaurant, and the gang all gets away except for one person that uh, Kenner had knocked out and thrown over the bar. This is when we get introduced to Lee's character, Johnny. And Johnny is not the sharpest tool in the shed. <laughs> and they also try to do humor between them. This was like buddy cop back and forth. And Dolph, ha- sorry, Kenner's face the whole time is like he doesn't get it. And Lee, or Johnny's face is always like he can't believe he's saying it and so there's like this really awkward it, split between them what's tough about it too is that brandon lee is being for, force fed these super corny jokes that he's just lobbing out there you would think he would have this like great retort to all this stuff <laughs> but instead he's just got this i don't get it look on his face like, he, like, like it just doesn't work <laughs> one of them has to be the cool one no one discussed who that was going to be before they filmed <laughs> I think what we're what we're seeing is that Dolph is not good for comic relief. No. Like it's just not something that he's good at. And that yes, he's just good at like action and being serious. But anytime, let's be honest, anytime he's done like even in Expendables, he's doing like the funny stuff. You're not laughing. Every time I saw him, he's supposed to be doing something. I'd be like, why don't you show some emotion? <laughs> Emote. Emote. <laughs> Emote. <laughs> 
doesn't show any emotion. That's that that is a good point though, because let's be honest. Like, yeah, okay, so Brandon Lee, they're telling him to say these terrible things that they are. And I feel bad for him because I think he's he'd be an okay actor if it's just these lines are just terrible. <laughs> But Dolph Lundgren is like, he don't give a shit about anything <laughs> that's going on in this movie. <laughs> it's like, ah, crap, I got to go do this again. No. <laughs> my, to- oh. my sushi. <laughs> so, but, but speaking of emoting, we, our next scene, we jump to Yoshido and he's with all of his homies hanging out. <laughs> and the look on the guy in the Hawaiian shirt's face, like he is super <laughs> serious. <laughs> You know, and, he, and poor guy gets no lines, but you can tell from his face, he is muscle. <laughs> so, but then we jump to Yoshido and we get this really weird scene where it's like, we're I'm watching him with this girl. And at first I'm like, I think she's about to blow him in front of everyone. It's like, no, I think he's about to bang her in front of everyone. <laughs> and then it ends with her getting her the- head cut off. And I'm just very confused. <laughs> she... And aroused. <laughs> a little bit. The smoking of the crack kind of turned me off. But, I mean, it was turning into a different movie. Let's be honest. Color me surprised and horny. <laughs> <laughs> the look, the, but the look never changed on the Hawaiian guy's face, by the way. Just, just hone in on that. While all this is going on, he is serious. This scene is so awkward because say, weird, of, right? because of her, and she's like, "I'll do anything, I'll do anything, whatever." And then also, like here, hit this. She's like hitting the crack pipe at the party. Yeah, right? I know. It's the most realistic crack pipe smoking I've ever seen in a movie. So, so I'm, maybe she's really. I'm, really- I'm thinking she's really smoking crack. <laughs> Also, they have a lot of crack. Yeah, I mean, like a whole pot, <laughs> pot full of crack. Yeah. You know how people have like Dude, peanuts man. out for you? This yeah. is a pot full of crack instead of peanuts. <laughs> like Breaking Bad over here. They look like bath crystals, just saying. They look like... <laughs> no, going to go Florida, man, and eat someone's face. <laughs> well, actually, that would make sense. They're smoking bath salts, and that's why it cuts her head off. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> real fast, just to cover uh, in a previous I've scene, read we, those stories. we do see Adolf have a or Kenner have a flashback about the Akusa killing his parents and it's Yashida. You know, just gloss over <laughs> Yeah, Let's talk um, about that hooker, though. <laughs> I don't think that will be important at all. <laughs> but that hooker that did the blow, she was important. <laughs> yeah, we had our priority straight here, Melissa, because we're just going to blow right through the crime scene where they find Angel's body. And find out she was so high on meth that she would have died. Anyway, we're going to go straight to the club where while driving there, we see a lot of great acting between Kenner and Johnny and a lot of great writing. And this, I wrote a note. It's like this is the first time I've watched a movie where Dolph isn't the worst actor in the movie. <laughs> Poor Dolph. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't mean it <laughs> they go into this club johnny beats up a few people in the hallway underneath the stairs as they go into this club it's a weird entrance because they they're not supposed to go in so they have to like mm-hmm. beat up the bouncer to get in and because they're not they're not they're not they know him they they know kenner <laughs> He's a giant. <laughs> <laughs> and so, this but see, see, that's what that's what's kind of confusing to me because does he beat the bouncer up every time he goes there if they know <laughs> yeah, him? So. You know, is this like a reoccurring thing? Well, that's why the bouncer's like, God or is this the it, first time he's again? ever tried to go in the club? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. He's like, I don't want you in here. God damn it. This son of a bitch again. God. <laughs> someone call someone call the the station. <laughs> Kicked him out three times this week. We see as they walk in a naked woman sumo wrestling competition. A woman laying out and they're eating food off of her. She's Sushi. naked. Uh-huh. And Monaco singing the best cover song of their Clapton song I've ever heard, actually. <laughs> I mean, you're not distracted by all the sushi in those women's crotch. <laughs> and then Brandon Lee's making jokes about how he's like, maybe I will eat raw fish. <laughs> Gross. Gross. All I know is that Tia is in the very good lounge singer. <laughs> <laughs> 
They go it, up and it, just, it did not sound very good. Maybe it's the audio. Maybe it's the <laughs> 1991 audio, but it did not sound very good. It sounded like it belonged in a club that you eat. That it belonged in a strip club where you eat sushi off of strippers. <laughs> Which, by the way, that seems like a very easy way to get a disease. <laughs> Talk about the salmonella. I'm just Damn it. I got chlamydia from the buffet. <laughs> I'm just saying. Who's are you gonna, really gonna trust a, a sushi from a strip club? <laughs> got these herpes all over my mouth. <laughs> yes. It's like crazy. This seems like the oddest thing they could be serving. <laughs> they go talk to Monaco. She says uh, she saw Angel last night, but didn't see where she went. She disappeared. Gang comes in. Of course, we got to prove that they can fight. No one can bring a gun. Well, it's just one guy because they fight. And then that one guy pulls a gun and then Hull, Kenner, and Johnny down into the basement. And that's when Kenner sees that it's Yoshida, the guy that killed his parents. He pulls a gun on them, decides not to shoot Yoshida. And then everyone just leaves. And I don't know what the fuck this scene was. He Sent, he sent his guards <laughs> yeah. up there to get them, had them come downstairs, and didn't talk to him about anything. No, they didn't, he didn't even threaten them. He was like, no, okay, they didn't even do anything. It was a wasted meeting. But you, you know, had to get that, that flashback, though. <laughs> it, it was, it's so weird. I'm actually starting to, it, it was at this point in the movie, I was starting to question what kind of cops these guys were. I have yet to see the station. I have yet to see their lieutenant. They have not checked in with anyone. They just met randomly at a sushi joint. Hey, I'm your new partner. And then they're traveling around, and then, like, all this crap is going down, and at no point am I seeing any other cops. It's like, they're not undercover, but they're not, they're not, like, vice. Like, like what the yeah. hell kind of cops are they? In fact, in other scenes, they run from the cops. Because they've committed too many crimes as cops. <laughs> Dolph keeps killing yeah, people. I, I I can't figure out. Are, are they robbery? Are they homicide? Did they get fired and they just kept the badges? <laughs> well, I mean, they do talk about that Kenner is on like his 20th partner. And they do show them at a brief. <laughs> they do show a brief scene where they're at the um, station and all the other cops are like, good luck, good luck. Patting Brandon Lee on the back. And he's like, oh, those are all my old partners. Like, because that's how many people he's been through. <laughs> Maybe they've all seen his dong and they don't want to go with him anymore. <laughs> He's going to seduce you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Once you see it, you'll be uncomfortable riding in the car with him. Uh, I, I, I can't, I, I can't compete can't with that. I'll always it. be second fiddle. Exactly. <laughs> what if it's looking at me? I can't compete with that. <laughs> <laughs> you, you always got to be you when you have to be Kenner's partner. You always have to be the cop in the sidecar of the motorcycle. <laughs> wait a minute, I thought the sidecar was for the dong. Like <laughs> that big. <laughs> Fast driving scene. Kenner explains himself finally to, to Johnny to tell him that Yoshida killed his parents and also says that Johnny's, you know, he can't hold a candle to actually be able to compete in this. So he should just go home. And I'm kind of with Kenner that Johnny's not much of a fighter. He doesn't even know Seattle karate. So. No, he doesn't. Also, like his reaction, Johnny's reaction <laughs> to Dolph telling him that that guy murdered his family. He watched when he was like a little kid. He was like, I don't care. <laughs> That's the stupidest story I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, Dolph is like the guy that killed my parents had an iron paw tattoo, and so did that guy. So it had to be him. It's like, well, <laughs> circumstantial. No, because he talks about that he scratched, that he cut him in the face. He used his own. He's like, and I, as a child, when I walked in on it, I grabbed his sword and I hit him in the face with his own sword and I cut him, and he gave him a scar. So that's how he knows who he is. Also, he looks just like him. It wasn't a sword; it was his own dong. <laughs> A quick aside. How about dogs? No. For those... I, I mentioned Seattle Karate. That's going to come up a lot in these podcast episodes because a lot of these great movies from these from this era, 75 to 95, involve karate because in the 80s, your danger lurked in every shadow and you needed to know karate. So in the, in the yes. amazing... In the amazing yes. karate movie, No Retreat, No Surrender. With John claude Van Damme. With JCVD. There's a great moment in that movie where they, because he moves to Seattle from LA, mm -hmm. and they are laughing at him saying that he could never be as good as Seattle karate. And that just 
has carried with us through every karate movie we have ever watched as we compare yes. everything to Seattle karate. Um, it carried with me when our son was in karate. I was like, these people couldn't do Seattle karate. <laughs> That's why we pulled him out. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, and, and it helps that one, we, we've all lived close to Seattle at one yes. point. <laughs> and to a, you'll, you'll find a lot of these movies involve karate and either – and then some major, like it'll either be in Miami or New York. And so you'll hear about Miami karate and how it can't hold a candle to Seattle karate. <laughs> I'm just saying. Or New York karate. <laughs> so that's why you're going to hear about Seattle karate a lot. And if you have like, I don't know, about 85 minutes, go watch No Retreat, No Surrender. <laughs> <laughs> it's a gem. That one. <laughs> we jump over to the Yoshida compound and Kenner and Johnny are watching from the outside. The compound looks like it's outside of LA. Yeah. But in the background, the green screen background of the car is sitting in, it's clearly like downtown LA. Yeah, it's very confusing. <laughs> it looks like it's up on a hill in the Hollywood Hills or something. But clearly it's right downtown. Convenient. Yeah. All I know all all I know is they are making a ton of crack or crank. Like a it, massive amount. And if also, Breaking Bad has taught me anything, it should it should be a lot more chemically in there. <laughs> also, can we please discuss that this is the most racist, stereotypical people that they have ever got together in a movie? They're like, oh my god, there's some there's some Mexican guys. Put them in a lowrider. Here's some racist white guys. Put them on some Harley. Here's some black guys. Don't let them talk. <laughs> They're having like the monthly gang meeting where like all the gangs get yeah. together and discuss gang business and like who gets what corner. <laughs> and, and apparently these guys are having a sale on crank. Uh, that's why they're making so much of it. <laughs> we, we accidentally made too much. You save in this scenario. Come on down on Saturday. One day only. Blowout sale. Warehouse clean out. I accidentally made too much crank. Come on down to Crazy Eddie's crank warehouse. We're overstocked. Zero percent down. Hundred percent financing. <laughs> well, we are making commercials for drugs. For some reason, I have a note here that Kenner and Johnny come running in at the very last moment as Yoshida leaves. But I can't remember. Like, I couldn't figure out what the hell was happening at the end of that scene. Because all the other gangs agree to Yoshida's terms. And then he is it when he pulls out of the compound? He, he stops sees and them? looks. Yeah. Ah. yeah. So he cuts that guy's arm off because that guy is like, he makes a racist remark to him. He's like, I don't want to sell your drugs. And whatever and then he's like oh you don't and he just cuts that guy's arm off and everyone's like okay we agree <laughs> and then they are leaving and then for whatever reason he sees, <laughs> he sees kenner and johnny and he just stops his car and just like looks at him and then shakes he goes never mind drive on and they're like we see you i see you too I don't know. His fist at him. yeah i mean are they supposed to be like surveilling these people because i mean i've seen miami vice and this is some terrible surveillance <laughs> they don't have a bug car <laughs> uh, okay, so let's let's get to what's probably the best scene of the movie. Okay, now a little bit of setup here. Yoshida goes to see Menako, brings her flowers and stuff at the club, and says to her that you need to come to me. I'm going to take care of you. She says no, and he just drags her back to his place. Yes, shows her the tape of Angel getting killed, and then says it'll happen to her unless she cooperates. So we know what is yeah. happening here in this story part. The next day. Yoshida is leaving and he tells his staff to make sure she stays. She's comfortable to make sure she's, yeah. Yeah. Outside, Johnny sees Monaco setting up to like do something, some ceremony. Sepeku. Sepeku. Yeah, sepeku. He says it, it's a ceremony of suicide, basically. And yeah. that most um, women don't do it. So, Unless they've then, been severely dishonored. Yep. Yeah, so he knows, mm -hmm. basically. He knows she's vulnerable. <laughs> I'm just kidding. So, <laughs> so he just. Takes off and and just busts on in there and kidnaps her right before her big ceremony. <laughs> like, I, I don't, what the hell? Just ruined it. He also, let's not forget, he's a cop, she, right? She's, I mean, she's about to sepeku. She's about to sepeku and he runs in and grabs her. Sepeku <laughs> over. <laughs> but also, like, is he still a cop? Because he like literally murders eight people, and he tells he tells Johnny when he's done, he's like, "Oh, by the way, I killed like eight people over there." Oops. Some by hand, some by bullets. 
he flips a car over and catches it on fire. Like, yeah, like okay, so you're not a cop anymore, right? Because I don't know you can. Re- and, you can't return from that. And not, and not, yeah, and not like like a small car. That was like an Oldsmobile four four two. Like, like those things are like all steel. Impressive. <laughs> He doesn't even tell Johnny what he's going to do. He just fucks off down the hill, jumps onto the roof, and starts massacring, like, John Wick style inside <laughs> yeah. of the house. No, He's like, hey, you follow him. Yeah. Johnny, you follow him, and well, I'm going to go get you, her, basically. Can, can you imagine what she must have thought? So first, she gets drugged to this gangster's place, and then she's just going to give – she's finally like, right, I'm, I'm just going to give up. I'd rather die than be his. And then she gets kidnapped a second time. Like, what the <laughs> hell's going on? <laughs> now Yoshida's general has to go tell him that he fucked up and that Kenner just waltzed in, murdered the entire staff, including the probably the cooking staff and the grounds crew. Yeah, I mean like, there were some people that weren't fighting back. <laughs> the poor maid, she didn't do it. The pool guy <laughs> just screwed. Like, <laughs> <laughs> to him, they were all Yakuza. They're all going down. Racist. <laughs> <laughs> then to show that he fucked up, he cuts off his own finger and gives it to Yoshida. And Yoshida's like, yeah, that's not enough. Yeah, I got to kill you. Sorry. God, but, man. Well, it, it, that, like, it's so brutal. It's like, like, stab me before I cut my finger off next time. Yeah, just stop me. <laughs> Could have done, done without that. Yeah. Like, hey, hey, don't, yeah, don't bother with the finger. I'm going to kill you anyway. Like, okay, then I won't, you know. It just adds insult to injury. Supreme distraction. Yoshida's pants are pulled up to Pat Boone height throughout the entire movie. Oh, my movie. God. <laughs> so... <laughs> He just has no belly button, right? That's what this is about. It's the next day, and now Monaco is at Kenner's house. And he's putting a lot of faith in her. Well, to be fair, she's putting a lot of faith in... Why does she trust him? He came by the club, like, one time? How does she... She doesn't even really know him. We don't even know if he's a real cop. Like, why is she trusting him? As soon as she hands it, as soon as he hands her the gun, she should have just shot him. You know? She's been kidnapped twice in less than 24 hours. And I'm he keeps saying. going, too. <laughs> she still gets kidnapped more. <laughs> now they're going to go down to this bathhouse where Johnny doesn't quite understand. He thinks like they don't have baths at their house. He's like, they're only <laughs> taking a bath. They don't know what the deal is. Because remember, he talks about earlier in the movie that he was he's not grown up in in his own like uh what culture. Like he's not cultured in his own background. Mm-hmm. His mom put him in karate, thinking that would help him connect with his culture. Because his dad's a white guy from like <laughs> yeah, it was weak ass Los Angeles karate, not yeah. Seattle karate. Not Seattle so. karate, so he don't know nothing. <laughs> Mm-hmm. So is that like supposed to be the opposite? Never mind. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> so of course a fight breaks well, out. I mean, when... His dad's in the, his character. His dad's white. His mom is Asian. And, 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 and yeah. Also Bruce Lee, like he lived in Seattle Real for a life, long time, so there's every reason he should know Seattle karate. Also Bruce Lee's in <laughs> Bruce Lee's in No yeah. Retreat, No Surrender. <laughs> yes. <laughs> The ghost of Bruce Lee. <laughs> Not really. It's just some other Asian man uh-huh. that they tried to pretend was Bruce Lee. Okay, you guys, seriously, you got to go watch No Retreat, No Surrender. It's just too much crossover here. <laughs> we got to do that movie. <laughs> Even the bad dubbing. Like, they did it all. <laughs> Back to the baths. Of course, they find Yoshida, and there's going to be a brawl, which means everyone's basically naked. So it's a lot of boob slapping. It's very uncomfortable to watch. I kept waiting for someone's ball to slip out because there were there was things were pulled up. <laughs> Come on. There's got to be one ball out in that thing. At what point? <laughs> at what point? Dolph grabs a guy's titties, <laughs> man boobs, moobs, and they both go under the water. And the then we get one too. of those one of those generic falling off a cliff screams uh, <laughs> that they added after the fact, and then he pops back out of the water. And, and that I water like, is like, how brown. hard did he grab his titties? Damn. <laughs> And that water, that water's brown. I'm sorry. I hope they kept their mouths closed while they were underwater. There's a lot of semen in there. Like, kind of gross. <laughs> Can't believe Shit. they went underwater. Semen and farts. That's all that's in that water. 
Everyone scatters before the police show up, including Kenner and Johnny, because of course they're not police officers anymore. And so now Kenner is going <laughs> to take Johnny and Monaco out to his humble safe house he has out in the woods. I'm sorry, but he's like, I'm sorry, I know it's not much. It's a three-bedroom yeah. cabin you built yourself <laughs> in Los Angeles, no less. <laughs> He's rich and he has a huge penis. Why does well, he that, not have a wife? <laughs> the way the house is and knowing Kenner's background, I'm pretty sure he built this to look like the house in Karate Kid 2. Because Karate Kid 2 is the best Karate Kid. <laughs> of course it is. Yeah, like, don't don't get me started on that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> gotta fight for your honor. <laughs> you gotta fight for her honor. You gotta get out the little drums. I mean, it's the better Karate Kid. It is. There's no, there is no. Mr. Miyagi's in his hometown with his old love. Come on. He has to fight his best friend again. And they're two old men. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I I think the original Karate Kid's one of those movies when you go back and watch it, you realize, oh, there's, there's really, the the conflict here is really kind of weird. And like, you should be encouraging (laughs) these kids. (laughs) Actually, yeah, you're like, maybe the Karate Kid's the bad guy. I'm not really sure what's going on. (laughs) <laughs> Maybe That's what I'm just, saying. Like, left I, just, it alone. I, I, I didn't okay. want to. I didn't want to get a bunch of emails about it. But yeah, if you go back and watch it now, you kind of feel like the Karate Kid's the jerk in this. <laughs> Kenner is out taking a bath. He's got. How does he even get hot water? I don't know. I'm not going to get into it about Why this house. Why is that like, that tub so small? <laughs> it's it's just it's a great place. I, it took a lot of work to build this place. Monaco comes out and says, "You're a rare man." It gets it takes a nude bath with him, but apparently. They don't do sexy time in the tub because it's they too st- hot. Did you see the temperature <laughs> in that <No>. water? <laughs> I'm sorry, but Dude you can't bathing. do sexy time in that hot water. Dude like that. bathing, zero penetration. <laughs> what kind of party is this? So then we get the after scene. It's it those like okay, so they haven't had sex yet. We get the after scene, and they're laying in bed, and then they finally have sex. And I was totally waiting for Dolph to be like, "She comes, she comes." <laughs> <laughs> well, that would be better than but, what he did. Instead, we get we get Monaco saying that time I heard you coming. So I guess it's, you know, I mean, I don't think not, anyone heard him coming because he was a freaking robot. <laughs> <laughs> he has he's taking her to. But that's what I'm saying. Bus. He's got he looks so disinterested. I I was waiting for the Ivan Drago. It's like the most boring train to pound town that ever. <laughs> <laughs> not into it like if he was writing it as a yelp review he would say four out of ten don't recommend (laughs) he really wasn't into it but his boy johnny was loving it from the other room he's watching the whole time he saw his big ass wang and he can't wait to talk about it all right we gotta say okay we we made a bunch of jokes about his gigantic penis about this whole movie right we don't really know if Dolph Lundgren has a huge penis, yeah, just yeah. for the record. <laughs> Whatever. I mean, I'm speculating that it is true. <laughs> we hope the best. <laughs> just make sure we're clear here, because where this, this joke. comes from, <laughs> it's because right after the most boring pound town visit that's ever existed, some people are storming his place and Kenner goes off to talk to Johnny. And while talking to Johnny, Johnny says, quote, you have the biggest dick I've ever seen. Because he's out of nowhere. He's like, I saw you guys out there in the hot tub. I knew that was going to happen because he's like, oh, Monaco's in my room and we were just sleeping or whatever. And he's like, I saw you out in the hot tub. I knew that was going to happen. And then like, he's like, hey, by the way, you have the biggest dick I've ever seen. <laughs> and we're like, what? <laughs> and then Dolph Lundgren doesn't say anything back. He's like, cool. That's a for real line. Yeah. It's just kind of like awkward. Movie. What do you say? Uh, thanks. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and, and and that's like the rest of the scene is like super awkward, and then like like it ends with them being kidnapped together, and it's still awkward. Because also <laughs> it's awkward because Dolph never put on any pants; he's just wearing these little tiny shorts, and you're like, "Well, there it is." <laughs> it's just showing it's brain everywhere you go. Right there. <laughs> I mean, yes. it's just right there. <laughs> just hanging brain. I cannot believe this movie when you read about it. <laughs> It got three different editors because the studio kept sending it back and saying, this is a terrible movie. Well, <laughs> re-edited it, and it, it, the first cut was 90 minutes. It got cut to 79 minutes. <laughs> yeah. And this line still made it in the movie. That still made it in the movie that they're gonna, that Johnny's going to compliment Kenner's penis. Well, what else is he going to compliment on? His, his sparkling personality? His ability what? to have sex and not like it? <laughs> 
I mean, he's got, now that you think about it, he's really got what? nothing going for him except for the huge penis. His parents are dead. His house is burned down to the ground. Both his houses. Both his houses are burned down to the ground. He had some really boring <laughs> sex with this girl and she's going to tell everybody. <laughs> What's crazy too is like, like you said, it's been edited three times. And at a certain point, like they're filming this scene. Do they not have a script for this? Like they had nothing to say other than, Man, your dick is big. <laughs> like that was the only thing they could come up with. Like, like at you. the time, no one was like, "Hey guys, like, like shouldn't we try and work a joke in? Like, <laughs> is there some way other that we could connect? Acknowledge the fact that Johnny's been watching them bang." The only thing I can think of is that in writing this, that Stephen Glance and Calliope Brattlestreet got together and said, "Okay, so when we describe the ultimate hero in this." movie what does he have like oh he's tall he's got big muscles oh yeah yeah he's really a really nice guy too he always thinks of the little person <laughs> yeah he's also got a gigantic dog <laughs> maybe maybe there's some kind of like hidden message Massive in that like wang <laughs> <laughs> Maybe there's some. I want. I know. You know what? I don't care. I'm just gonna say it. I'm gonna think about this movie forever and fondly, and think that Dolph Lundgren has a huge penis. And they were like, "We have to work this into the movie." <laughs> Brandon's like, "I've seen it. It's big. We gotta work it in." It <laughs> yeah, exactly. was, I thought. It was literally <laughs> touching the urinal cake. I'm sorry. Like, that's how I will remember this movie because that's the only good thing that came out of it. So. <laughs> <laughs> it was so big that they're like, we can't not mention it. We have to mention it. That's what I'm saying. It just makes me appreciate that he was He-Man that much more. Like, like <laughs> He-Man is that much more of a hero. Now I'm just picturing him holding his dog over his head. <laughs> I have the power. He does. That's how he got that job, okay? <laughs> Anyways... <laughs> There's still more movie left. After it, after we find out about his dog, we have to continue on to watch so, the movie. The rest of the movie doesn't matter. Because we keep talking about his dog the whole time. <laughs> He's got a huge... <laughs> There's a quick scene at Yoshida's where Johnny and Ken are getting electrocuted, but they're able to get out of it. The whole time, Ken is still in his shorty shorts and military boots. And then before they get away, they get stuck in a car. They get picked up with a forklift, gets put in the crusher, but then they're able to escape out the back window. And decide not to attack them, but he said, let them think that they're dead. Okay, that's... And some... pounce later, because he needs to get into his Japanese montage preparation video first. Yeah, but first. that's some crap for her. She's down there getting... She's got to be kidnapped again and go be with the guy who who raped her and kidnapped her again and then burned down. <laughs> She's just, like, hanging out with these people, like, great, thanks. <laughs> you had to go put on your Japanese... Uh, whatever that is, robe and pants and stuff while I'm down here with the guy who raped me. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so what caught me off guard with this whole scene set up, the two things that jumped out at me. One, does he have a TV in his car? Because this is 1991. Like, people weren't rolling with TVs in their car until Exhibit <laughs> um, like in like the 2000s. <laughs> also, the plan is now that they think they're dead. So they are going to hang back and they are going to come up with a plan, and they're going to catch them by surprise, right? So we get this quick, very Jean-Claude Van Damme training scene of, like, Dolph getting ready for the big fight. We go back, and we have another month. We, it must be the next month, because we have the next <laughs> monthly gangs meeting. <laughs> Apparently, the plan is to just come running in guns a blazing like like no plan at all so like why did they why did they hang back like what was did they take time to like build to like make his costume like did they go like get fabric and michaels and hot and glue, glue gun? they literally charge in there without any kind of plan they throw the surprise angle right out the window yeah i think they have no plan at this point well the surprise is also to just drive a truck through the side of the building and then come in guns blazing when you're supposed to be dead i guess that's a surprise <laughs> <laughs> they split up kenner chases after yoshida johnny ta chases after um the main general they catch up on the roof battle which ends with the general falling into a vat of i'm assuming crank like the massive amounts of crank that they're making at this factory which is also flammable because he throws his lighter in there and explodes well then <laughs> well and i'm gonna call shenanigans on the fact that the bad guys weren't able to shoot the gigantic swedish man chasing them <laughs> <laughs> he is a giant compared to them 
uh, how bad of a shot do you have to be? He's like seven feet tall, like 300 pounds. Like, come on, guys. Kenner catches up with Yoshida, who has staged a gasoline trail to Monaco. Shootout. Kenner is able to barely save Monaco, which just leads to where we're getting to the very end here. It ends with a samurai sword fight on the street in Little Tokyo during the middle of the Tokyo Parade. I mean, just ruining. I was going to say, way to ruin the parade that everyone's worked hard for all year long. (laughs) (laughs) The entire parade watches as these two men fight to the death and with a fantastic ending of Kenner shoving a sword through Yashida and then throwing him in the air onto a spinning firework display, which then starts and explodes. And he, like, explodes, like, disintegrates. Which is a good thing they did that, because if they would have lit that during the parade, lots of people would have been injured. (laughs) Luckily, Yoshida was there to take the brunt of it. Also, think of all those poor kids that this parade is ruined now for the rest of their lives. (laughs) I think Kenner gets lucky in the sword fight, too, because when it begins, he's getting his butt whipped. Like, he should have challenged him to fisty cuffs more than (laughs) than, uh, than with samurai swords. Uh, Eventually, it works out, and Yoshido gets blown up and burns, and everyone lives happily ever after because the case is solved. Wait a minute, guys. Were they working a case? Did we miss <laughs> there that? There was a case? <laughs> yeah, they just walk off. No one asks anything. All the people at the parade just bow to them as they walk off. And everything's fine. They're going to have so much to account for. Like, he murdered so many people in this thing. Right in the middle of the street. Drove a car, stole a truck, drove it through a car, who's blew g- up a building. Who's going to lead next month's gangs meeting? <laughs> None of those people are going to snitch. Don't worry. It's all right. <laughs> this movie boiled down to basically three scenes. And one of them involved a penis. I think we picked out our favorite one. I think that one's really obvious. <laughs> I said in the very beginning, this is not a good movie. This movie is about a man. This movie is about a man and his giant dong taking down the Yakuza with that giant dong. <laughs> But I don't want to get into my review too much here because there's like, I have mixed feelings on this movie. <laughs> you have mixed feelings on his dong? Is that what you're trying to say? <laughs> That's included in my review. <laughs> Let's first get to the music from this movie before we get into our final thoughts. All right, John, this movie is is like slightly off. It's like if it was rotating like a tire that's missing a weight. And I'm assuming music is going to be kind of similar. What do you got for us this week? Yeah, so doing music for these movies sometimes can be difficult. Trying to to find who these people are because sometimes they use session artists. Sometimes they use songwriters to write specific songs just for the movie. Sometimes they use other people's songs and then use other people to perform those songs. So it gets kind of convoluted. An example of this is one of the songs is Slow Hand, was written by John Bettis and Michael Clark. Now you might remember the name John Bettis as he was the same same songwriter that was in our music from Harley Davidson and the Marlboro Man. Mm -hmm. Michael Clark is also a songwriter, just not as famous as John Bettis. <laughs> Slow Hand is originally a Pointer Sisters song, not Eric Clapton, by the way. Mm. It's a Pointer Sisters song. And it is performed in this by Tia Carrera in the club. So that's actually Tia Carrera performing it, which, like I said, you know, maybe it's the audio from the older movie, but it just didn't sound very good. Not quite <laughs> Pointer Sisters, I'm saying. Sorry, Tia. I love you. I still love you. I don't care if you're 52. <laughs> the Pointer Sisters, by the way, uh, this is on their eighth album, Black and White, from 1981. They are a female R&B group from Oakland, California, hmm. and they achieved mainstream success during the 70s and 80s and have spanned four decades, I think. Uh, we're having a little trouble deciding on what constitutes a decade. <laughs> There's some confusion. (laughs) Debate. (laughs) But they won three Grammys, and they got their own Hollywood star on the Walk of Fame. They have 13 top 20 hits between 73 and 85. Sisters June and Bonnie Pointer 
began playing clubs in 1969. Shortly after, they would add their little sister, Anita, before getting a record deal from Atlantic. But actually, while they were signed to Atlantic, they would release several unsuccessful singles, and it wouldn't be until their sister, Ruth, would join and make the trio a quartet in 72 that they would change record labels to Blue Thumb Records, and they would start seeing success. They'd win their first Grammy in 75, and then off to the races. Bonnie Pointer would leave in 1978 for a solo career, in which she would see some modest success. They would have over 10 years of success there, and they continued to record in the 90s and stuff all the way till now. Apparently, in 2004, June Pointer has struggled with addiction for much of her career. And in 2004, she finally had to step away from the group. She have actually ended up passing away uh, from cancer in 06. But June was replaced by Ruth's daughter, Issa. And they're still releasing music. They had a number one hit in Belgium in 2005 with the song Sisters Are Doing It For Themselves, featuring the Belgium singer Natalia. But not the one from this music, but we'll get to that later. (laughs) Eventually, Anita has had to retire due to health reasons. But now, Ruth's granddaughter also joined the group. So Ruth's daughter and granddaughter are now in the group and the Pointer Sisters are still a thing, uh, with Root being the last surviving original member, or the last original member in the group, sorry, not not last surviving. That leads us to our next song, The Woman in Me, written by Walter Kander Kahn, and performed by Natalie, not Natalia, not the Belgian one (laughs) but natalie so this is this this goes back to what i was saying guys so the woman in me there are two mainstream songs called the woman in me there's a donna summer song and a shania twain song i do not believe that either of those were written by walter kander khan i could be wrong but walter kander khan was an american dj and record producer he was a top 40 dj but as a record producer he worked with artists like paul simon and the group The Movement, but I would say the biggest thing that he produced was the song I Wish in 1995 by the rapper Skilo. Yes, I wish I was a little bit taller. Oh my god. I was a baller. That song. Oh yeah. That is the song. That's like his, that's the big one. He wrote that song. Quality. Uh, I'm sorry, he produced that song. Even better. Yep. Unfortunately, the performer, Natalie, is some mystery session musician. I have looked high and low and through everything, and I cannot find who the actual performer is. I've Mm. seen a few that list an artist named Natalie, but it's wrong because she was born, the artist that they list was born in 1979, which Mm. means she would have been 12 at the making of this movie. Well, yeah. <laughs> and so I highly doubt she's the one singing that song. So I don't believe it's her, and I can't find anyone else that match it or anyone else who even listed that in their LinkedIn. Which, if I recorded a song for a movie, even if it was Showdown in Little Tokyo, <laughs> I would still list it in my LinkedIn. I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't care what type of work I'm in now. I could be a secretary. That's still going to be in my LinkedIn. I also wrote a song. I also performed a song one time for this little movie called Showdown in Little Tokyo. <laughs> that I'm sorry. That's as much information I can give you. But at least I was able to tell you that Walter Kander Khan was the guy who produced I Wish by the rapper Skilo. So at least I got to <laughs> mention Skilo. Our last two songs of music are Round and Round and Boys Night Out by K.K. Wild. All right, guys. So you remember how in the other music from our previous podcasts, I kind of talked about that band by talking about their biography I read on their own site, correct? Mm. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Well, th- this is according to Chris Leak. Dot Wixsite.com. <laughs> Chris Leak, by the way, was the CEO of Tejas Records. I believe Tejas Records has since closed. But at one point, they claimed to have won 23 Grammys. I don't think so. Unless there's some, like, state-run Grammys, like, smaller. I don't know. But the at some point, I think Chris Leak... <laughs> At some point, I think Chris Leak had something to do with K.K. Wild, the band. 
But let's just get into it. So K.K. Wilde is made up of Chris Curry, who was on vocals and guitar, Eddie Wilde, who was on guitar, Stephen Scott on bass, Rich Hall on keyboards, and Brian Black on drums. So let me paint a picture for you guys. Born in a small loft in Hollywood, California, Chris Curry would create the band K.K. Wilde. It all started when Chris Curry's previous band, Kid Curry, was coming off a great run. <laughs> they just released their EP and won an, an MTV Music Award for their video for the song in America. So it's an MTV award for the video for the song in America. Oh, uh, they, and they got this huge, huge, huge record deal, guys, from Epic Records. They were mm -hmm. gonna, this is it. This is going to be their big break. Kid Curry's going to sign the, the dotted line, and they're going to be the next Motley Crue. But that didn't sit right with Chris Curry, man. He knew that once they signed that offer, it would be make or break that band. And after some touring and some hard thinking, he decided to walk away. And he left Kid Curry right there, didn't sign the offer, and went back to L.A. He held auditions and ended up putting together K.K. Wilde. His new band would be born. Their first gig would be in February of 1989. And guys like Kid Curry, it would take off. They would start to get some serious play. They would tour. They would purchase their own 1-800 number. Because <laughs> girls from around the nation would want to call and speak to them. <laughs> they even bought a tour bus. So that they could handle their own tour and their own merch. And they had fan clubs guys popping up around all over the country. So they were the first band, by the way, to use uh, rack mounted hard drives, according to Chris Leak. <laughs> and guys, bands like White Snake and Kiss went to their shows to see how it's done. <laughs> That's right. Kiss is showing up at our shows. <laughs> According to chrisleek.wixsite.com, <laughs> after their album Cocaine Cowboy would see so much success, they would again get major record labels just just throwing offers at them left and right. But once again, Chris Curry, man, he's like, "Hey guys, I'm telling you, we're doing good on our own." We're making, we're producing our own song, uh, our own music. We're, we're, we have all the rights to our own music. We have our own tour bus that we own. We don't make any payments on. <laughs> like, why do we need a record label? So it would cause a rift between them. And eventually it would end the band. Eventually they would split. Steven and Brian would start a business. I was unable to figure find what business that was, but hopefully they were successful in whatever business that was. <laughs> I believe Chris Curry was somehow involved with Tejas Records, which is why they're probably being so nice to them. <laughs> Unfortunately, Rich Hall passed away, uh, which, by the way, it does make a mention. It talks about Rich Hall very highly. Uh, apparently, Rich Hall was like Chris Curry's best friend. And mm. so... Uh, you, you are missed. But guys, good news. In 2015, they announced that the boys are getting the band back together and K.K. <laughs> Wilde is releasing some new music, according to chrisleek.wixsite.com. And there you guys, you have your music. Oh, man, that was actually more than I thought that was in this movie because I knew it was going to be tough because it was a traditional soundtrack, just like, you know, the background random music, a chase scene music, car chase, track number four. But this went way better yeah, than I thought. Yeah, and I, and yeah, yeah, and that's I could have very well, I could have very easily have just gone with soundtrack and just because it was literally like a guy that would do a score for like a TV show or a movie. And so they would, they just release like clips from the movie of like soundtrack or like mm -hmm. digital music in the background. And I could have just talked about him. You know, it would have been a lot of like, 
he also worked on this show and this show's music. And this is why this movie had terrible music, <laughs> you know, but it seemed like so much more fun to talk about the actual songs that made it into the film that they had to credit, especially since I felt like I could have a lot of fun with KK Wild. And perfect timing because they have new music as recently as 2015. <laughs> it's even hip now. And go well, out, guys. Go out <laughs> and see a Pointer Sisters concert because she's got, because Ruth has got to be like 80 and she ain't going to be around much longer. So enjoy it while it lasts. Well, let's go give our final thoughts on this movie. I'm sure they're going to be glowing in support of this movie let's go give our final thoughts all right john why don't you kick us off what are your final thoughts on this movie so my final thoughts are twofold one one of the things i love about watching these movies and doing this podcast and all the research and everything behind the movies is that you almost get to travel back in time and see when this happens see how things became successful or just crashed and burned. In 10 years from now, we might not remember the buddy cop movie that The Rock did with Jason Statham or something. You know, mm -hmm. 20 years from now, we might look back on that and go like, oh yeah, they did this movie and it was terrible. But when we look back on it now, when we look back on stuff 20 years ago, like now, a movie like Hobbs and Shaw with The Rock and Jason Statham. Like, it's huge. It's a blockbuster. When you time travel back to 1991, you have Dolph Lundgren after playing two I very iconic characters in He-Man and Ivan Drago. And he's supposed to be, he's the next Stallone. And you have Brandon Lee, the son of the great Bruce Lee. And like I said, studios, they were just trying to put him in stuff because something had to stick, right? He's hes Bruce Lee's kid. People are just going to love him for that. And to see that like this, they paired these guys up and everything was supposed to work out and it just crashed and burned. <laughs> and it literally led to about a 10-year period in Dolph Lundgren's, Lundgren's career where he was just stuck with these direct-to-video movies which is also why i want to do red scorpion because i want to give dolph his, <laughs> his longer his due because that is a fantastic movie and i feel like he's strong in that as the lead <clears throat> but that brings me to the second half uh the second part so not only do we get to travel back in time and kind of and kind of look at this time period in which this crazy pairing of a cop buddy movie paired out as you will find as you listen to this podcast we are no strangers to direct to video movies <laughs> we are very familiar with the entire john claude van damme catalog <laughs> and we have already made mention to billy blanks and the likes of emilio estevez's weird uncle <laughs> you know like we are not strangers to these movies you Personally, Joe Estevez i watch a ton of <laughs> what did joe do to you <laughs> he's just trying to make a living <laughs> i'm just saying uh, i'm just saying i i watch a lot of those sci-fi channel sci-fi channel movies there is a place for direct-to-video movies there's fun to be had with them even though they are corny and sometimes they're just awful awful movies there is a place for them <laughs> and you know sometimes you just want a bad sometimes you just want to watch something like a starship troopers 5 or a tremors 8 you know you know it has no business being good but it's it's good to be bad sometimes when you're watching a movie and i feel like when i watched this movie it was good to be bad it was fun because of the bad and i mean just the laughing about the dong scene alone <laughs> was worth it it just had so many golden moments in it some of these movies that we are going to watch are going to be bad but they are good because because they are direct to video style i definitely agree with that sentiment which is sometimes these bad movies you just have to give them a chance and just because other people said that they didn't like them doesn't mean that you won't like it and yeah, this movie's got some pacing problems. It's got some really bad humor. There's some really bad lines in here. But like I mentioned early, 
it's nonstop action. This movie never stops. It's pedal to the metal the entire time. Now, that's for good or bad. Whatever decisions that they make, they just, <laughs> it's, it's just, it is what it is. But you got to watch it. You've got to give it a chance. And you have to go into it expecting to have fun. And that's what we did going into this movie. We expected to just have fun. It wasn't going to make some big political point. It wasn't going to be highly rated on Rotten Tomatoes. Like none of that stuff mattered. And that's one of the things that we have to get away from, especially in movies, yes. is waiting to see something because it was highly reviewed, because the Rotten Tomatoes score is really high, or all the influencers on YouTube said it was a really good movie. Fuck it. Watch Showdown in Little Tokyo. It's hilarious. It's fun. It's exciting. Dolph Lundgren is actually a real action hero in this movie, kind of like in Red Scorpion. He's also got a gigantic penis. <laughs> <laughs> they worked it into the movie. Like, <laughs> <laughs> There's lots of reasons to watch this movie. It's a lot of fun. It's it's fast paced. It's it's what you get. It's it's a type of movie that on a Saturday night or a Friday night, you were sitting at home with nothing to do, watching USA up all night. <laughs> And Showdown in Little Tokyo came on, and you're like, I ain't got nothing mm -hmm. else going on. Right after this is Bikini Car Wash 4. So <laughs> I'm going to stick through this one because I really want to get to Bikini Car Wash 4 and Emmanuel 12. That's going to come on after that. Uh -huh. So I'm going to give it a shot. And you end up having a lot of fun. It's worth it. And I will defend this movie and these kinds of movies to the day I die. These movies are great. They're a lot of fun. These people that make them and that star in them are a lot of fun. Melissa, what are your final thoughts? First of all, everyone knows the best bikini car wash is number three. <laughs> They're doing it for charity. <laughs> Don't test my knowledge. I've seen these movies. <laughs> They're trying to save their sorority house. They got stuff to do, okay? No, I, mean, I agree with everything you guys have said. Obviously, I love me some action movies, and this movie is full of action. Also, I love Dolph Lundgren for all of his acting ability. <laughs> I love Eman. I love Red Scorpion. I love all of those. And I will say that I was not expecting to come out and talk about his dong, but here we are. <laughs> Why you gotta give these movies a chance? And I, I think that I mean I think maybe we were a, the only thing I would say is that maybe we were a little harsh on Brandon Lee. Let's be honest, he didn't really get a chance to show what he could do. That was cut short. So <laughs> the movie is entertaining. That's the most important thing. That we laughed. We thought it was funny. That there was some stuff that didn't make any sense <laughs> but, <laughs> but i will always remember it as the movie where i found that dolph lundgren has a huge penis <laughs> dolph wants to dispute that he can get, <laughs> he can get, get visual <laughs> evidence <laughs> yeah <laughs> i'm just saying that's gonna do it for us on go with the heat we would love to hear from you email us go with the heat at gmail.com get us on twitter at go with the heat facebook.com slash go with the heat instagram.com slash go with the heat this was the most not safe for work episode of this podcast yeah. ever. Sorry. <laughs> the changing of the guard as we move yes. from TV to movies. There's more opportunities for NSFW type content. We apologize to those of you who suck it out then got to the penis parts for like, what the hell was happening on this podcast? <laughs> we apologize for not warning you ahead of time, but also apologize for nothing because it was a hell of a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> Be sure to check out that website. Go and do me a favor. Go out and check out some almost new music from K.K. Wild, <laughs> according to Chris Leak. <clears throat> dot Wix. <laughs> dot com. Be sure to check out that website. Go with the heat dot com. You can find all the ways to contact us, all the ways to subscribe. We are virtually everywhere when it comes to the show. So you can be able to find us on any of your podcast platforms of choice. That's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode and we'll see y'all next time. Bye, pals. Thank you.